night, six of them had a terrible dream about you. There was a revelation about you. And then when the prayer meeting came and all the prayer guys now came together, one of them now said, see, I saw something like this. Said, what? That's the same thing. So how will you try to redeem your image in such a situation? Because the threat that was sent to Elijah was not a human being sending a threat. The reason why she was absent was because she was on an escapade of consultation. She had drawn that threat from the belly of the altar. She swore by the spirit of that altar that this would be the destiny and the fate of Elijah. So it was a threat that was concocted from the realm of the spirit. This guy just finished leading an entire nation to God. And when that threat came, I don't know how strong it was. It, it disbalanced his soul. So much so that he decided to flee for his life. The guy that could invoke fire from heaven, what was he afraid of? You see, you cannot analyze it that way if you don't understand the power by which that threat was concocted. And that threat sent this man into a season of transition. And the Bible reveals that he went south of Judah. That's a long journey because Bathsheba is in the southern, the southernmost part of Judah. And that's where he went and he dropped his servant. And just in case you are, you are tracking him with GPS and there's a tracking system, your tracking system will only be able to trace Bathsheba. And after dropping the guy in Bathsheba, he walked for one day. So if you come, you know, you can go trek for one day in any direction. The last place somebody saw him was in Bathsheba. And the Bible says he himself went a day's journey. A day's journey. The direction was not mentioned. Whether he went north, south, east, or he went a day's journey. Even if you are reading the scripture, you won't have been able to trace him. He was, he was not available. And he went to a place that doesn't have a name. And in that place, there was a juniper tree. Right? You know, do you have palm trees in Ghana? Uh, okay. The juniper tree is a relative of palm tree. Only that, um, uh, the reason why I'm explaining that is because if he was so tired and he was looking for shade, he won't choose a juniper tree for shade. Because the juniper tree is not good for shade. Just like palm trees may not be the best trees you might need for shade purposes. So what was Elijah looking for around the juniper? Well, that was his God zone, you know. Yes, that, that was his God zone. That's where he encountered God as a young prophet. Since he came, I don't have time. He located his God zone. Notice that when he got to his God zone, he did not pray. He just slept. If Elijah was going to locate or trace his God zone when he was in trouble, it means he had left that place for a very long time. Meanwhile, he was doing the revival thing. And God confirmed what he was doing in the city center. Meanwhile, his God zone had been vacant for a very long time. The next city close to his God zone was Bathsheba. And I think, I think that um, he left this juniper tree and went and manifested some things in Bathsheba. That was how he blessed some lives. And they gave him that his servant for free. That's it. We don't have CDs to give you, Ghana CDs to give you. We don't have anything, but we have this book. Take this book. That guy had become a full grown man when Jezebel encountered him. And he began to walk in a reverse mode back to Bathsheba and left the gift he received. And then he walked on a reverse mode back to the juniper tree. 
And he did not even vocalize the prayers that he was hoping to say at that point. He just laid down. And when he laid down, because that place was now a spiritual space that has testimony of his labors previously, the visitation of an angel was sponsored. And the angel came and gave him food to eat without telling him why. He ate, he drank, he slept again. This encounter he was receiving was sponsored by the relics of his fellowship with God on that spot. He had some relics. There were some things on that ground that testified that there was once upon a time that a man visited this location in search of God. He had raised and prosecuted a priesthood at that point and there was angelic activity that filled that space. He had created a spirit city in that location on the account of his priesthood. And when he came and laid down there, his previous activities on that spot sponsored an angelic visitation that took care of his meal. Hallelujah. God did not take care of his fear, not take care of his challenge, the threat. If we go on, you will find out that God was not even concerned about his hunger. Because Elijah thought it was his hunger God was trying to minister to. Until the second dose of bread now came. And then the angel told him why he was being fed. He said, rise and eat. Not because of your hunger. If it were for your hunger, it will allow you to die. Rise and eat. Not because the journey is far. It's a stone throw. The journey is too great. Not far. It's too great for you. In this your composure, in this your current state, <laughs> it's too great. So you will need to eat so that you can survive the journey. This man was fed because of a great journey. But he converted the energy that he got from that feeding into a lamentation. He said, now Lord, it is enough. Because if you are saying you are feeding me because of another great journey, are you not aware of what happened after the great, I made a name for you. I made a name for you. I, I made you popular. And see the result of my evangelistic initiative. Now you are saying that there is a great journey. You say, okay, it's all right, it's enough. Um, you, you are the only one that knows about that journey. Me, my own journey ends here. It is enough. But he made a statement. He said, take my life. Why? Because I am not better than my father's. It means that he came from a long line of prophetic people. Most of his ancestors in the prophetic ended after that threat. And the last one that handed over to him warned him about a season that will come when the powers of darkness will harness their full potential. To seek any light in the land to quench it. They told him about that. Do you realize that the prior information they gave him about that day of evil did not, did not, was not an advantage to him, obviously, because he was not adequately prepared for that day, even though he was pre informed. The fact that you were told that danger is coming doesn't necessarily equip you for the times ahead. Prophecies not necessarily an advantage it can even be a snare it, it would have been better for you not to have known oh you're not with me i was invited to preach in a missionary university to take some courses in that university so i 
was given a, a cubicle to stay and a cruise of water to survive on. Because they expect that you should be in meditation and prayer and you shouldn't be looking for food. But a cruise of water will be available. While I was praying, one of the staff of the school passed by and the Lord spoke to me. He said, tell this one, there is a terrible season that is coming. And in that season, if it meets you unprepared, your outcome after that encounter will be bleak. There will be nothing left again in terms of your future. And I told him, I called him, I told him. So he said, He's ready. He's ready. And that was how I ended. Seven years later, he was struck with cerebral malaria. You know, that kind of, uh, the person behaves as if he's schizophrenic. Uh, and that was the beginning of the journey. And I mean, that guy is exceptionally intelligent. But he never made any progress from that point anymore. Because even though he was pre-informed of a doomsday that was coming, that was not necessarily a strategic advantage to him. Elijah was informed, but did not translate to anything positive. I am not better than my fathers. There was a testimony of insufficiency that was on ground. Are you with me? As pathetic as that situation is, if you, if you never get to that point where you see your insufficiency, you are useless to God. You are totally useless to God. You'll be serving God on the strength of your flesh. And immortals don't understand the language of flesh. They don't understand the language of human effort. They only understand grace. Because when God builds, He builds with grace. And if you are going to understand what God has in mind with which He expects us to prosecute His enterprise upon the face of the earth, His spiritual energy, you will not sign up for it except your insufficiency stares you in the face. And up until this time, Elijah saw himself as a classical figure. A guy that can bring about a change. Glory to God. <laughs> a big guy. And something orchestrated from the spirit realm had to be allowed to touch him. So that he would see that the utensils he had gathered all this while cannot prosecute the mind of God. Even though he was begging to die and his state of insufficiency was obvious to him. God didn't rebuke him because God had been waiting for him to get to that point for a very long time. He didn't get that encounter by the juniper the first time he attended school there. And he obviously left school before graduation. So when he came back again, the curriculum was revived. And the issue of brokenness had to... He wouldn't understand brokenness if it was taught like a lecture. He had to have an experience first. Because many of you... Mm, okay. I'm in Ghana, so I can't strike today. Uh, hallelujah. He never knew that in the arsenals of God, there was... Because if we investigate the menu that was brought to him, we may not have time for that, but uh, I guess, no, let's try, let's try to investigate. What kind of food did they give this man? Because it was bread. And you think that the angel stopped by a bakery to get this bread. Until you see the impact of that bread on Elijah. Because when he ate that bread, 
the bible says that he walked 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of that meat unto horeb the mountain of god he did not sleep in the night the bread sucked out sleep and weariness in every form and fashion such that he was able to maintain his walk for 40 days and 40 nights unto horeb that empowerment is only for people that acknowledge that in their default mode in their best orientation they are still incapable of furnishing the expectations of god they are do you know that in all of this man's prophetic ministry he never knew that there was any strength administering bread that was in the heavens he never knew that until he came to this point there are several things about god you will never know until you arrive at the altar of brokenness you will never know it and are you with me hey. please don't be offended i just have to say the truth okay don't be offended don't be funny if you look carefully you will find out the civilization that we have in the body of christ right now doesn't have the capacity to take us beyond this point it doesn't have the capacity meanwhile we have not yet seen opposition or at least in ghana you guys have not seen opposition yet the beast of reckless wickedness has, has not moved here yet and then suddenly you will find out that people that prophesy are helpless about this beast People that hold meetings and nine million people attend are totally irrelevant about a menace that has overtaken society. It means that the kind of church we have been doing is, is church within our own enclave and conclave. And once we finish that our ceremony, we don't have evidence of what we did in society. The kind of priesthood we are running it centers around this infrastructure called the pulpit meanwhile in the days of jesus's ministry he had no pulpit we need to find out ask ourselves what are we doing because i know schools in egypt once you finish attending for four years you become a terrorist what do we become when you attend church? Whatever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth and the issues and the dynamics of the kingdom into which we have been born are not issues that we know. Our vista of measurement is primordial. We are looking for what unbelievers don't need Jesus to get. As the height of our, the hallmark of our spirituality. There's something wrong with our vision. It is because uh, something is missing. And this thing that is missing has been missing for so long that we have not realized it. But in this state, we are about to collide with something that will reveal our insufficiency. If care is not taken. That was what happened to Elijah. He started too long on the stage, far away from the juniper tree, until he was totally oblivious of what God was saying. He liked the idea of being a star, and God had to orchestrate, allow the enemy to look upon him with vengeance, so that at least he knows the address to the juniper. That's where men are forged. I know you have a title. Maybe you are a bishop and you operate with a title and all of that. And it gives you a sense of uh, importance, relevance in society. You must have found out. You know we have prophets that can call people's name in Nigeria. You, you know some of them. And tell you your father's name the day you were born. But those same prophets could not tell where the Chibok girls are in Sambisa Forest. 
then you find out that there's something wrong with our prophetic ministry. Because it only affects people that come to gather around us in our clique and our club. But it doesn't have the potency to bring about direction to generation. That's not the description of the prophet according to the book of Acts of the Apostles. If you check men like Akabos, they gave direction to. This is what is going to happen. On the strength of this, I recommend that you do this, do this, do this. But we have people that can call names. Meanwhile, we are lost as a generation. And this deception, this deception is bringing us to a point of, of an encounter with the kingdom of darkness that will reveal our insufficiency. You must have heard in the news some of the kind of stuff that is happening in the church in Nigeria. It's an exposition time. And many people that were on the crescendo, there are several discoveries about them that have been made at this time. It was a transition season for Elijah. It was in the midst of that brokenness that he saw that there was resource in heaven to quicken a man that was insufficient and incapable. And he was able to walk 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. Do you know God was standing on that mountain waiting for him? And God did not close the gap so that to make it easier for him. He, was, he didn't change. He was where he was. He was expecting Elijah to move to the valley and to come to the mountain. And that's the same valley that we call the valley of dry bones. Many prophets tried to make that journey. They ended up bones. Now, I came to tell you that what we have celebrated all these years will not survive seven years. The next seven years come. All the things we have tried to keep, we have tried to protect, a storm is coming that will reveal its insufficiency. Only men that have access to the second dose of bread will be able to find sufficient strength to arrive at Horeb, the mountain of God. I need to take another scripture. And that scripture will be Revelation chapter 1. After Revelation, then I'll start teaching. That is if there's time. Revelation 1. Hallelujah. Are you doing Revelation 1? Okay. Um, oh my God. Okay. To make it shorter, let me start from verse 9. I, John, this is an introduction. John is telling us his, um, his credential, revealing his credential. He said, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation and, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. And what brought me to this isle is because of the word of God and because of the testimony of Jesus. Now, this was not the political reason why he was on Patmos. The reason why he was on Patmos was because he was the last patriarch. He was the only one among the disciples. Are you with me? Can we travel now? Okay. He was the only... Do you remember this guy, John? Okay. If you don't remember him, I'll show you. This John and his brother, James, came to their mom and said, Mom, We are seeing greatness in the life of Jesus. And we, we know you, you are the leader of your women forum. You know how to. 
you know how to talk you are quite persuasive with your utterance can you visit jesus and secure a position for us because we know he's going to the throne the way we are seeing him he's migrating straight to the throne so go can you get him to commit himself about our possibilities around him and it was a woman that was tipped for this kind of role and the woman said are you people not my ah, you know how women can hey jesus she was, she was excited and she went to jesus and applied grant that one of these my sons will be on your right hand the other one will be on your left hand in your kingdom Jesus assumed that she knew what kingdom she was talking about he didn't question her, the kingdom just, hey all right ask them because there's an ordinary level requirement that they must fulfill in order for them to be ad adopted Yes, O level requirement. And the O level requirement is that they must be ready and willing to partake of my cup and my baptism. And he did not tell, he used metaphors to speak to them. Because if he had spoken plainly, they would escape. So he said, <laughs> My cup, my cup. Meanwhile, that cup that he was talking about is a cup of suffering. Because if we are going to prosecute the mind of God upon the face of the earth, to implement the kingdom of God, it is going to be at great cost. Great cost. I have not rested since January. Since January. I don't even remember the last time I cleaved to my wife. I just said, oh God. As it's a plague to marry a pastor. It's a plague. It's an affliction. If you are not called for it, you will always be insufficient. You will. Oh, I can see. And so she, she, she applied, and Jesus said, "Well, um, let's be sure that the all ordinary level requirement has been met." Are they willing to drink of my cup and to partake in my baptism? The woman said, she would have allowed them to answer. But he said, this is my sons, they are true bonds. <laughs> and Jesus said, all right, in this kingdom, there are authority levels. At my own level of authority, I can accept to include the cup and the baptism into their destiny. However, the file has been forwarded to the quarters wherein there will be a decision about who will sit on the left and right. After my own approval, you can't even say you will not, you will not do it again. Without them knowing what the cup and baptism was for and about. And it came to pass that when Satan rose up in the Acts of the Apostles, it was James that was killed first. Because it was him that he was the one that the heavens had allocated the baptism of death to. Because the, 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 the high point of the, of the ministry of Jesus was his dying. It was his death, burial, and resurrection that forms the permutation into entrance in the new creation. And so this James was the first matter because his was the baptism of death. And the reason why this guy could not die is because that's not his portion his own portion is suffering a cup you are not with me <laughs> if you have read bible history and historical perspective you would have discovered that they attempted many times to kill this man in fact they put him in boiling oil he came out dead was far from him even though his body was mutilated and after that they now put a mad stone around his neck and threw him into the sea he lived in inside of the sea as a water creature for three days <laughs> then he was banished to patmos that since we can't kill you go go and i don't know go and do something with your life <laughs>
do do something with what is left just do something but away from civilization and they ensured that it was on Patmos so that there was a mighty sea that separated him from the people he was supposed to minister to I don't know how long he was tending to his wounds but the Bible says that he, on the lost day he happened to be in the spirit now see he met a procession heaven was not waiting for him heaven was you know in heaven the civilization is a perpetual continuum and so it was the day he piped into heaven the, the scene he met was it didn't start with that scene the realities have been going on and then that scene now appeared that was when he was in the spirit and then he was before the truth now this man he said he came to the I love Patmos. He was speaking from the standpoint of understanding now that the reason why I was released to Patmos was because of the word of God. There's an aspect of the word of God that I was supposed to receive. There's an aspect of the testimony of Jesus Christ I was supposed to. So he's speaking from the standpoint of understanding. Not that if he speaks from the standpoint of experience, it would have been that I found myself on the Isle of Patmos because of persecution. If his experience was a focal point of the whole matter, but he was speaking from another perspective, he was speaking from understand. Do you, have you been able to really translate the meaning of every pressure that you have gone through and heaven's perspective about that pressure? Because we, we, we normally sit in our own perspective and then we wail and wonder and then say God is not faithful but this man was speaking from an understand. He knew that there was a reality that was beyond his own personal experience that was captured in God that was responsible for everything he had gone through. And when he, he picked it up, then he now told us from that perspective that it was because of the word of God, it was because of the testimony of Jesus Christ that, that he came to partners. Are you with me? All right, let's go on. Next verse. I was in the spirit on the last day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I can't touch this because, because if you check, if you check, if you check, okay. All right. What's up? Saying, I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Stop there. Now what is it? It means that there is a book that God wants this man to write. He had written books before. I know you know. He wrote so many books. He wrote his gospel. He wrote First John. He wrote Second John. He wrote Third John. And now he's discovering that the reason why he was preserved and sent to Patmos was because there was a book that he had to write. That means he, prior to this time, he was writing apostolic books to establish the brethren in the truth concerning the Lord Jesus and to bring encouragement unto the house of God. But this book he's about to write is a book for which he has no competence before this time to write. Because it's a book that is not apostolic in nature. It's a book that is prophetic in nature. And there was a dimension of God that he had to encounter in order for him to gain the competence that is required for him to write this book. See, so what we are seeing here is that this man is entering into a higher dimension of his ministry. But what was the way? The way of Patmos was the way into this dimension. That means God had ordained that he will be in Patmos. But how did he come to Patmos? He came to Patmos by intense persecution. Intense brokenness had found expression. There was nothing left to desire life for. It was in that shattered, broken situation that heaven's voice became clear to him, inviting him to come into the prophetic encounters that will qualify him for his next line of ministry. You will never know. You would think what you are doing now is the zenith in God. And you can build a title around it. 
and build a conclave, build a clique, build a club around it. And then, <laughs> ah, meanwhile, this man had arrived at that point of, of glamour in ministry. He had arrived at that point. And at this time, he was the last living survivor among the apostles of the Lamb. He was highly revered, almost worshipped among the brethren. And because of that, for God to help him, in order for him not to be killed by God himself, he had to orchestrate the separation so that he will live longer. Because there was yet a book for him to download. And the, the people that are supposed to be the final consumers of this book are on the other side of the sea from Patmos. Are you, are you seeing the challenge that this man is faced with here? And uh, I don't have time to touch that. So go, go to the next one. Now, if there was any disciple that knew Jesus, it was John. I don't have time to show you how that John's book is deeper than all the other Gospels. Whereas Matthew saw Jesus as a king. Uh, 33 times in the book of Matthew, you will see this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Because it's a book of the kingdom. If you go to the book of Mark, you will see that Jesus was seen from the perspective of a servant someone that um, doesn't have the right no a slave not a servant a slave someone that doesn't have the right to choose what he will do because the bible revealed that um, uh, he was given a body in order for him to prosecute that which was written in the volume of the books and the book of mark happens to capture that servitude into which Jesus was released and deployed. The book of Luke is the book of the universal grace of God. And in the book of Luke, Jesus is called the son of man because he is seen as a representative of the human race. And the things that God would do to him will have implications on the entire human race. But in the book of John, he is seen from the perspective of his divinity, from the perspective of the life that he has, which is alien to humankind. And he is called the son of God. Now, you see, only John saw him from divinity. And that's why in the book of John, you are going to find 18 things that Jesus did. And the only reason why he could do those things and say those things was because he was God. And all of that is in the panoramic view of the book of John. And the book of John happens in the book of life. Are you with me? This man knows Jesus. He was the disciple that the Bible says uh, normally leans on the breast of Jesus. So there were many details in his book that you will not find in the other Gospels. When this guy came to Patmos, in order for him to enter into the purpose of God, on the ground of that brokenness, God had to reintroduce himself to John. A reintroduction had to take place. Because John, at this time, knew Jesus from a time-based revelation. Jesus of Nazareth. It's time-based. But Jesus happens to be an eternal personality. And except John captures that fact, he cannot enter into the realities that will give him the stature to write this kind of book. And so Jesus came to introduce himself to John and called himself Alpha and Omega. Now, in the original Greek, there's no and in between Alpha and Omega. It is Alpha Omega. I don't know how to explain that. But, okay. How many of you know this is your day? Benny Hinn's, uh, Benny Hinn's program. This is your day. Okay. Um, there was one of those times that I am a dangerous student of that man's life. Okay. So, there was one of those times that he had to preach somewhere in the Middle East and he didn't have time to take a, a case set to the um, production manager for This Is Your Day program. So when they called him up, hey, you have not brought any tape. What are we going to show? It actually takes two weeks of post-production for a This Is Your Day um, film to come out. He was not even available at all. So he said, pick, any, pick an old tape, play an old tape at least, bridge the gap. 
So the production manager just picked the, the tape randomly. But professionally, the tape he picked was not the kind of tape he should have picked. Because in that tape, Benny Hinn gave um, a very specific word of knowledge about a lady that was wearing yellow. Her name was Phoebe. She was in her living room. She sat on the couch and she had cancer and God was healing the cancer. It's, it's not professional for him to use that kind of tape that has a specific word like that. Well, but the tape was already running. So there was nothing the production manager could do about that. So uh, 10 minutes after the broadcast, then this lady now calls in and says, ah, she's the Phoebe that Ben Hinn was talking about. Uh, she was wearing yellow just like he said. She was sitting. Now my question is, was that an old tape? Oh, you are not with me. Okay, because you are not with me, I will not, I will not probe. Now, you see, we do some local things, local things, and we think is we don't know Jehovah. The systems that we have built and the <laughs> I, we we need to go closer. The the dimension that was revealed in that tape, it's it's an everlasting dimension. It's not time-based. But the tape provided a facility for that dimension to be trapped. It was still potent with power in that dimension. I prayed for the sick ones, for blind people, and then somebody recorded it and took the tape somewhere and somebody was listening to it and then a blind person now was around the place in another city and was participating as I was praying, was answering. And then the, the person started seeing. And I didn't even know. I just went to that city and I was told, see, this person is seeing because there's something beyond time that was at work. That thing never started and that thing will not end. It's like a stream. And he was trying to tell John, I never began. You know me as Jesus of Nazareth is a, def is, is a defective revelation. And in order for you to step into your calling for the moment, you will need to know me again. And that's what happens at the Juniper tree. When this man was compelled to know God again. Just in case your life has crystallized and you've been in one civilization for so long, you've not been able to break forth beyond. It is because you, a revelation of God has been withheld from you. That's why you are still in one stroke of civilization. This man is about to experience a paradigm shift. And this shift was predicated on a revelation of God that he never knew before. Notice he turned back. All right, he turned back to see. What did he see? Seven golden candlesticks. So where was he? Mm, calm down. Try use your brain. Use your brain. These seven golden candlesticks is what we call the menorah, that is in the holy place. In the holy place, we have the brazen altar, the table of showbread, and the menorah. If John said he turned back to see the menorah, it means he was in the holy holy of holies. Okay, let's leave that. Since since you can't picture it, let's leave it. He had gained mileage. <laughs> Can you? Oh my, you are not. Okay, let's let's leave that. Let's leave that. Let's leave. That. It, you don't gain my. It, it. He had gained mileage. So much mileage. And when he turned back, he saw one like unto the Son of Man navigating through the seven golden candlesticks. There were several places, locations in the temple that Jesus would have been. But he chose to be within the seven golden candlesticks. And he, two metaphors were used here. Two metaphors. And I'd like us to crack those metaphors 
if we finish cracking them, then I can now tell you. I can say something. Hey. I'm using Nigerian time here. What is happening? Okay. okay. So Jesus was navigating in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Um, I, I will touch this later because we will have to unveil what the candlesticks mean because a metaphor was used here. When you go into the spirit realm, um, spiritual principalities like concocting proverbs, they don't like speaking plainly. If you meet God, never think that what you heard him say was what you think. You will need like 15 years for you to understand. It's a proverb. It's concocted. It's, uh, so, he used the metaphor there. He saw seven golden candlesticks. And you will need to allow that same spirit to come and interpret what the candlesticks mean. Don't use your brain. You will be wrong. Okay. No time. Okay, can you jump jump to verse um, 18? Quickly. Let me try to round up. This is still Jesus speaking. He said, And he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Next verse. He said, Right now. This is the real writing. He was brought to Patmos to write. But he could not begin writing until he had encountered that dimension, Alpha, Omega. See the kind of writing he was asked to write. Write the things which thou hast seen, present, the things which seen, past, the things which are present, and the things which shall be hereafter. No, stop that. Go back to 19. Let us see. Uh, we have the things which thou hast seen, that's past, the things which are present, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's future. That's prophetic writing. What kind of book is that that you are writing? It captures the past, it gives perspective to the present, and it also unveils the future. He had no competence to write about these kind of things outside of the revelation of Alpha Omega he captured. See, there was an empowerment that brought him into this new season. The way we enter into new seasons is not by um, printing a poster and saying next level, new dimension, new, new life. The way we enter into new seasons is by fresh encounters. A fresh encounter makes you a new man because you need to have a change in your paradigm. A fresh encounter brings you to a point where you find out God's willingness to stay in covenant with you so you have a rich supply of His grace because of that fresh encounter. So, the writing is prophetic. That's what I wanted you to see in verse 19. And he wrote apostolic writings before. But in order for him to write prophetic writings, he had to go through that process. And that process did not begin until he went through all he went through to arrive at Patmos, which ensured that he was totally broken. Because his destiny was to bear the cup of suffering. It is through that cup of suffering that he accessed this dimension of prophetic writing. Because when God takes you through such a process, the outcome is an empowerment that you cannot get any other way. You know, we have pastors that preach alike. They even dress alike. And if one buys a car, this type of car, the other one will buy now. So we too. We too, we have this. When you have this kind of encounter, you don't need to advertise. There is nothing anybody can do to copy you. Because the process you went through to get what you got that made you who you are was custom made. Was custom made. Alright, let's do the interpretation before I start. I have 12 points, but I will just drop one. I drop one point, then you can go and study the rest of the point. Verse 20, please. 
The mystery, aha, uh -huh, you can increase your volume a little. The mystery, yes, that's how principalities in the spirit, that's how they speak. They speak in terms of mysteries. Yes. So when, you, have you ever had a dream before you finished dreaming, you woke up from your dream as intelligent as you are? Went to Kumasi, read engineering. You are quite intelligent. But you received a dream from God and you could not interpret it with your brain. The communication mode is higher than that which your brain can handle. So you need to go back to God. And, uh, okay, this is the real time. Ooh, okay. You need to go back to God for him to enlighten your understanding. And take you into his thoughts so that you can think his thoughts. That's when you can have the accurate interpretation to the dream. It, I know it's quite humbling to know that as educated as you are, there are communication modes that are quite more complex than that which humanity can handle. And so God will have to upgrade you. You are still not. He will have to upgrade you, educate you quickly, bring you into his thoughts so that you can now touch the things that are trapped in that dream that God intends you to know. That's how principalities speak. They speak in terms of mystery. And so the principality himself will have to do the interpretation. Don't receive dreams from Jesus and go to pastor for interpretation. Go back to the source of the exposure, of the exposition. If not, you will get it wrong. Fifteen years later, you will know you were wrong. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand. So Jesus had seven stars in his right hand. And Jesus was navigating in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. So the principality now comes to give us perspective. He said this, the seven stars are the seven angelos of the seven churches. I don't have time. I don't have time. Oh, see the church... The church in scripture, we can look at the church from the eternal perspective. We can look at the church from the um, global perspective. We can look at the church from the universal perspective. We can also look at the church from the territorial perspective. And the context from whence the church was viewed in the book of Revelation happens to be territorial. And that's why it's the church in Smyrna, the church in Philadelphia. The church in Laodicea, there are territories on earth. So, this word angels here in the Greek is angelos, it means messenger. The messenger to the churches are not spiritual angels, they are pastors, they are human beings because the context is what territory. You get that? Good. Now, um, according, are you with me? So, the ministers that are set in strategically. In these territories to bring the perspective of heaven the only way they can bring the perspective of heaven is because this immortal is upholding them oh yeah no um, meanwhile the metaphor that was used to symbolize the minister in this context is a star that's the metaphor Indicative of the fact that a minister is supposed to be the illuminary, just like a star is a luminary, but held up in the galaxies of God. And I need to explain that. Turn your Bible to the book of John chapter 3. Let me explain for you. The galaxy from where you speak from determines whether you're a minister or not. Because there are stars, the seven stars are held in his right hand. All right, in John chapter 3, verse um, 1. Are you there in John 3? Thirty one. John 3, 31. Thank you. He that cometh from above, please, you must know where he's coming from. You are not here. A star is held up in the galaxies of God. 
And that's where he bears witness from. He that cometh from above is above all. And just in case he is operating from that orbit, that orbiter, circumstances and situations will not be able to truncate the purpose of God that is represented in the life of that individual. Because he that cometh from above is above all. He that um, is of the earth is earthly. How do you know an earthly, earthly messenger? Is when he speaks. The earthly messenger always speaks of things of the earth. Always talks about how you can get a breakthrough, a promotion. Meanwhile, in the kingdom, are you with me? Because the Bible is the book of the kingdom. God knows you need breakthrough. Okay? But the orientation for the kingdom is that you don't seek breakthrough. You don't seek wealth. You seek the kingdom. And as you seek the kingdom, God causes what you need to prosecute your divine purpose to navigate in your direction. We must understand this. Because serious wealth is going to come on a few individuals in the house of God that have started seeking God accurately for who he is to advance his purpose. Then they'll just realize that part of your calling is to be a steward of kingdom wealth. For this kind of people, as long as you're aligned with God, you will have the power to get wealth. And God would have told you how and what you need to deploy this wealth to achieve. Hallelujah. The Bible says he that is of the earth, the way we know where you're operating from is if we check what you're speaking. Because he that is of the earth speaketh earthly stuff. Next verse. And what he has seen, that is he that is from heaven, is what he has seen, what he has heard, that he testifies about. And that means if you are from heaven, and you begin to bear testimony of the things of heaven, it will be obvious where your source is. And the metaphor that represents the minister from this perspective is the star. A luminary that is held up in the galaxies of God. That's where he shines from. Bearing witness. You will know that is the spirit of Christ that is speaking to the churches. Those were, that was how ministers of, that, of those days were. He that has ears, let him hear what the spirit. Meanwhile, human beings were the ones speaking, using their focal cords to communicate. But it was not earthly. What was speaking actually was the spirit of Christ bearing witness, bringing testimony. So you will know through the speaking where the person is operating from. And we cannot claim to be building an earthly church. And then we, we claim we are not aware that this church will be impotent against the wives of the devil. No, that's not, it's not true. In my own opinion, we are where we are because some people chose that will end up here. That's, I can't see it any other way. We can't be using deploying earthly resources and then ensuring that with the mind that one day we'll be strong enough to possess the gates of the enemy. That's not how it works. It's upon this rock, I will build my church. Right? It is when we have built on the revelation of Christ, the resultant effect is not emotional, it's not a prayer point. The gates of hell will be totally incapacitated. If you build any other way, you will have the gate of hell to contend with forever. So you can't say we are here mistakenly. It's, it's deliberate. To navigate us to this sorry position is a deliberate attempt that has been orchestrated. Right now, except something happens, except something drastic happens, the church of our day has no, has no message to the young people. Except something drastic happens in our time. Christianity is going to suffer great loss in the next 18 years. The reason why I brought us to the book of Revelation is to show us that the man that John became, in order for him to write that book, which was the last phase of his calling and destiny, he became another man in order for him to write that book. 
so when you submit to the protocol of brokenness the man that rises from that ashes is not the man that died you become another man it is within the context of that new man that you can prosecute a new agenda there is something that will have to die in order for you to be qualified to receive the grace that will enable you to prosecute a new agenda on the heart of God. There are several people that have tried to fit in, several dealings, dealings, dealings. And the reason why God would not compromise those dealings is because he knows what he wants to achieve. There's something that will die. And then a man that never existed before in your vessel will now arise. It's that man that can take the two doses of bread and walk to Horeb, the mountain of God. In my research, in the scriptures and in the spirit, I found 12 such men that will need to be on the scene. If the agenda of God is going to prosper on this earth, and if we go beyond this comical level into something that is kingdom and strategic, then there are 12 kind of men that must come upon the scene. Um, I, I said I will show you one, you study the 11. So let me start my Bible study now. First kind of functional. I would like us to check Matthew chapter 13 and pick one from there. After which we'll start praying. Several things I saw in the spirit while I prayed. Much more than what I prayed for. Then I began to fear because and I started asking God, how will I ah, how will I do how can I represent you this evening in this way, this way, this way. So I, I now said I won't preach all my messages. In fact, you need to know what I prepared. I prepared, I had to throw them away. Then I invoked my ancient diary. Anytime you see that diary, it means there's trouble. <laughs> but I had to keep all those things down and trust God. Come with me to Matthew. Let's do a critical study. Matthew 13. Are you there? All right. Um, I, how can we do this? All right. Let's try. Matthew chapter 13 verse 3. Long reading. And he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sower